Welcome to For All Kerbal Kind. This video series intends to document my progress as the United States in friendly competition with the Beardy Penguin as the Soviet Union to land the first Kerbal on the moon. In this first episode, I'd like to get you all familiar with how this is going to work in as concise of a way as possible. We both have matching realism overhaul installs in 1.8.1, accompanied by its career mode, known as RP1 with matching difficulty settings. Apart from some early game parts, Beardy will be limited to Soviet technology and launch sites, and I will be limited to the United States. We'll be taking inspiration from real-world rockets and mission profiles, but are in no means limited to them, so expect some Kerbalized alternate history themes to show up for sure. These saves will be played in tandem with one another, and when one of us places something into orbit, we're going to splice that craft into the other's save as well, so we are sure to see some nice friendly maintenance visits to each other's spacecraft, if you catch my drift. I think that just about covers everything, so let's begin, shall we? Before we get into the launches today, I wanted to hop into the editor and just show you guys the crafts that we are going to be launching in this episode. Uh, probably in later episodes, we're going to be doing speed builds and the like. But for right now, I kind of played this like off and on as when I could. So the gathering footage for these speed builds would be a little bit, well, hectic. Uh, but this is the first rocket that we are launching, the WAC. Corporal, and this is being launched from a launch pad as well as, well, the belly of an aircraft. You'll see that later on this episode. But all it encompasses is a tiny Tim booster um, and an Air B engine. This is the first uh, config of the uh, Air B engine. Later on in the episode, we do unlock the second one, but that is not what is going to be used on this first one. And then we have a procedural tank and nose cone. Uh, carrying the correct fuel for this engine and the whole thing you know launches up later on we actually have a two-stage variant of this once it loads up here yes we have a two-stage variant of this and actually we don't have all of this all these bits on here we don't we don't have these at first at first we launched it without these so just tiny tim and then two of these arabies and let me take a look yeah this is the I think it's the same. Yeah, it's the same first config. And I think also later on we do switch these very engines to the second config. Uh, that may be the Corporal 3. There was one launch where we had another tank here carrying sounding rocket payload for the Air Force. Uh, but that one is not going to be present there. Uh, yeah, don't save. Wow, Corporal 3. I'm not sure if we have this one in the episode or not. I think actually, yes. Um, this is the this is the one where we did have these bits, biological sample capsule, which produces science that we can't transmit, we have to recover, hence we have a parachute on top. And these engines uh, should be using, yes, the XASR config. The tanks are a little bit thicker, instead of 300 millimeters, it's 400 millimeters thick, except for the tiny tin, which is, well, the same size, it's not a procedural part. Now to get over to the aircraft, which are arguably a little more interesting to look at, as soon as this loads up here, we have the first aircraft we built. Uh, I called these the US Air Force trainer aircraft, uh, sort of like a World War II design. Uh, for the first launch, I did also have decals on the wings themselves, but for some reason, it didn't want to load those. The the conformal decal mod doesn't really work on procedural wings and some procedural parts as well. Just taking a look at these, we've got, these are just aviation lights. All of the wing parts and bits are uh, procedural wings, so are very easy to edit. You know, you can just move them around willy-nilly and make some pretty crazy looking designs. We're gonna do that just for just for the hell of it just show you how easy it is to move all these bits around and put them into you know wing shapes however i couldn't be bothered to actually fix that uh so we're just gonna get, get rid of that because that gives us a little better room to see the missile underneath which is the exact same one as before the whack corporal one 
after we intend to sort of fly this and into a shallow dive from 10 kilometers to 8 kilometers and then pull up into a, almost a little over a straight up maneuver in a, in a loop and at that point in time we let go of this rocket it, it launches off we switch to it and do this bit and it flies up into the atmosphere and see how high we can get it uh, later on we actually don't see this one next but it is the next one that I started building the US Air Force Kedior or Kedior um, this is using the Derwent 5 engines it isn't really any more capable than the prop engine honestly I just wanted to build something that used jets it is actually a little bit more fuel efficient and can fly for longer I think it has a little bit better acceleration as well but again this is just both of these aircraft, apart from launching the missile, are just up there to fly around and gather science from various biomes, as well as just have a little fun while we wait for some stuff to unlock. Now, the Kel X1 is what we'll end up with at the end of the episode, in which we're going to attempt, I'm not going to tell you how it goes quite yet, I'll have to watch to find out, to break the sound barrier. Um, this isn't, of course, the, the Bell X1 wasn't all black, I just thought it would look cool. And this, by the way, is just trickery, because these are just fully black flags, decals, on the Iconic X1 part, which usually looks like this. Uh, some little things, the nose bit is simply a procedural nose, wasted, different things. That's what it usually looks like, but it worked perfectly for the nose bit. And it is powered by two XLR-11s, the first variant on that engine. Oh, and by the way, I, I don't think I mentioned it. On the first prop aircraft, uh, I believe it is this engine right here. Do, 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 do. Yeah, the Pratt and Whitney R2863W Double Wasp engine is what powers that first prop aircraft. So, anyways, enough with the editor. Let's get on with the launches. January 1st, 1951. The US Air Force has contracted construction projects from the foundation for its newly founded space and aeronautics program. Work has begun towards the assembly of several sounding rockets, a concept derived by the US Air Force to launch missiles into the upper atmosphere. Plants have been laid out to launch said missiles from the surface, as well as from the belly of one of their trainer aircraft left over from the war. This program from henceforth will be known as Project Black Powder. April 1st, 1951, Project Black Powder begins. A WAC corporal launches from a small launch pad in Brownsville, Texas, reaching 145 kilometers altitude. This missile transmits telemetry and supersonic flight analysis back to the KSC before crashing into the ground at T plus six minutes and 52 seconds. Within the hour, Gerald K. takes off into the Gulf of Mexico in a trainer aircraft carrying the very same corporal missile intent on reaching a higher altitude than the ground-based launch due to less atmospheric pressure upon ignition. Unfortunately, the missile's systems fail and its main propulsion unit does not fire. Gerald's aircraft later encounters electrical problems while photographing the KSC and surrounding area, and he is forced to land. The aircraft undergoes refurbishing over the next 48 hours.
post operations report from the first leaves us with 17.8 science and roughly 100k funds to spend. Research on new technology begins, and construction of a WAC corporal to be fitted on the trainer aircraft once again begins as well, scheduled to complete before the end of the month, as well as another WAC corporal too with an added stage to be fired from the surface. April 24th, 1951. In the morning, after having some problems with its tailwheel, Peter K. takes off into the Gulf of Mexico in a trainer aircraft. Reaching the correct altitude and speed, Peter pulls up to let go of its corporal missile and stalls the aircraft, causing it to spin wildly. While recovering from the stall and in a steep dive, the missile releases on accident, directly leading to failure of the mission. Peter is instructed to land the aircraft immediately. Another corporal missile is ordered to be refitted to the trainer, and the Foundation decides to ground Peter for the time being. May 17th, 1951. Milton K. accidentally releases the missile on the runway, thinking it will start the engine of the aircraft. Luckily, the aircraft is not damaged, and the missile does not fire. Unfortunately, slight damage to the missile's structure means it can no longer be used. Once again, a corporal missile is ordered to be refitted to the trainer, and Milton is grounded. June 9th, 1951, Eileen Kay is the fourth pilot to attempt the black powder air launch. She takes off into the Gulf of Mexico around midday, reaching the correct altitude and speed for the launch. The missile is released two seconds late, but fires successfully, reaching 165 km altitude. After landing, Eileen reports slight structural damage to the trainer, which leads to the decision to retire the aircraft. With the loss of the trainer aircraft, the Foundation orders a jet-powered U.S. Air Force Kidior to take its place, scheduled to arrive at the end of the year. June 14, 1951. Just before dusk, a WAC Corporal II lifts off from the service. This two-stage sounding rocket reaches 269 kilometers, all the while transmitting scientific findings back to the KSC before crashing to the surface at T plus 9 minutes and 43 seconds. August 21st, 1951. Midday, a second Corporal II lifts off from the surface carrying 52 kilograms of classified payload for the U.S. Air Force. Its intended target is 160 km altitude. However, roughly one minute into the flight, the second Araby engine fails and the missile crashes to the surface. September 10, 1951, critical components for high-speed flight have completed their research process. Plans for an experimental aircraft, the Kel X-1, have begun construction, and all efforts are made to ensure it is flight-ready by the end of the year. November 26, 1951, a third Corporal II is launched, intent on testing survivability of fruit flies on a suborbital trajectory. 
The missile fires as intended, but is not powerful enough to escape the atmosphere. Parachute deploy is successful, proving the concept is viable. Plans are made to deploy a new upgraded variant of the Araby engine on the next corporal launch. December 13, 1951. Gerald K. takes flight into the Gulf of Mexico in the brand new Kel X-1 experimental aircraft. Two training wheel guider gears decouple from the wings upon lifting off from the runway. In less than two minutes, the aircraft has broken the speed of sound and sustains this speed for over 30 seconds in level flight, performing an unplanned barrel roll in excitement, much to the dismay of ground control. Gerald pilots the now unpowered glider back to the runway at KSC, utilizing parachutes and reinforced wings to slide to a halt. Gerald is considered by the press to be a great American hero. December 24th, 1951. Christmas Eve at the KSC. The new KDOR aircraft has finally arrived and the Foundation pilots can't wait to try it out. Eileen takes the controls with Gerald as co-pilot and lifts off from the KSC heading west towards the mountains. After collecting scientific data flying above mountainous and tropical regions, they return home and land at the KSC. Despite overshooting the runway, the aircraft sustains zero damage and the science collected will prove to be quite valuable. Foundation crew and faculty take a week off for the holidays after quite an eventful year. That's going to wrap up this first episode of For All Kerbal Kind. If you'd like to see what the Soviets have been doing, uh, the link will be down below as well as on the end screen for the first episode on Beardy's channel. If you're interested in getting these mods for yourself, there's a guide and tutorial linked in the description below on how to do so. This episode I tried something a little bit different than my other series. Uh, in that one, I sort of just ramble over the entire video. Uh, this time, after each mission, I actually had a pre-written operation report, sort of, that I read off of for the voiceover. Uh, let me know if uh, that's worked or didn't work, how you felt about it in the comments below. Anyways, I want to thank you guys so much for watching, and peace out.